Good morning. Let me ask you please to find in your Bibles the book of 1 John, not the gospel according to John, but the short letter of 1 John toward the end. Turn to your maps and flip about 20 pages forward if you have a print Bible. It makes it easier. And I want to start reading chapter 1 and verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world, whole world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments that we have together before your word. Please speak to our hearts, exalt your word, exalt the name, person of Christ in our hearts and minds and our lives from here to the ends of the earth, please. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week, uh, Dan Stein preached to us about the story of David and Bathsheba. And one of the most uh, powerful, one of the most poignant moments in that is when Nathan the prophet went to David, tells him the story, and David, of course, is is angry, but then Nathan says to David, you're that man. And he says a few other things, but David's response is basically all of his his cover-up and all of his scheming, all of this is just unraveled. You don't know if his shoulders slumped and his head bowed. We don't know this, but he's just simply said this, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan's response was immediately to assure him of forgiveness, that he wouldn't die, he wouldn't die for, that, for that particular sin. Well, that's a powerful example of what this text that I've just read teaches us. But it's not just about confession of sin. Uh, and if you're already panicking, don't worry, we're not going to ask anybody to rise and confess their own personal sins. And you can, but um, yeah, you can. Um, <laughs> but I'm not asking you to do that. This, this idea of confession is really not about, it's not therapeutic. It's not just so that you'll feel better. There is much more going on in terms of confession of sin, acknowledging what sin is. And I want us to see three things from the text today. First, that God calls us into fellowship with him. Second, to enter that fellowship, we have to have a proper attitude, proper response to who God is. And third, there is a barrier to that fellowship that has to be removed. So before we look at these, we need to get a little background about 1 John. If you've read this letter carefully, perhaps you've seen some clues that the church to whom John writes has gone through a very difficult time, have gone through some division, a split, and... That's how we know they were probably a Baptist church. And uh, I'm Baptist, so I can say stuff like that. Um, but evidently, some people had left. Now, that's hard. I've been in those situations before, conflict and sometimes separation, and those are really hard. But this is made even harder by the fact that those who left have now, they have embraced false teaching, and they are proclaiming their own false teaching, and they are saying they are the ones that are true Christians, and these to whom John writes have actually missed it. They are false. And John writes first to assure them, to encourage them by showing them what genuine faith looks like and contrasting it with the false teaching. And so as he does this, he he gives us a wonderful picture of just what genuine Christian faith looks like day-to-day life. And it's really helpful if, for example, if you ever struggle with assurance of salvation, that is whether your own faith is genuine, uh, 1 John will really help you. And I say that from personal experience. I Really deep struggles with this early in my Christian life. And I got all kinds of bad advice and some good advice. But 1 John was medicine to my soul. 
Uh, but that's, that's another sermon, and I've probably already preached it, so <laughs> let's just move on. Um, the false teaching that John addresses is called Gnosticism, some form of it. It's very vague. It's hard to define with a lot of specifics. So I'm going to oversimplify. But the Gnostics taught this, that basically the material world, all matter, is inherently evil. Okay, And the immaterial world, what's, what's really, the only thing that's really good is the spiritual world. So nothing that's physical is good. Only that which is immaterial or spiritual is good. This had some consequences for their Christology, for their understanding of Christ. That is, what they said is Jesus cannot be fully God and fully man. He might be one, he might be the other, but he can't be fully God because if he's God, he's good, so he couldn't be fully man. So that's why John goes to great lengths in the first few verses to talk about what our eyes have seen, ears have heard, what we looked at, we watched carefully, what our, what our hands touched. So he goes to great lengths to emphasize both the deity and the humanity of Christ in this letter because they are, in fact, both true. But another consequence is that of, their, of the Gnostic worldview is that sinners in this life could not have real fellowship with the real God, with the holy God. Only the few spiritual people, conveniently enough for the Gnostics, they, they fit that. So only us could have that because we are spiritual enough. So there are elements of Gnosticism also, recommend, I think, re- reflected in, in a modern practice today of, of people who um, try to bring their bodies into line with what they feel or what their minds think. And uh, that's, that's another sermon that I'm sure Mike will be happy to preach someday. So let's come back to the text. Look at this. First, John, the first thing I want us to see is that God calls us to have fellowship with him. We see in verse 5 he makes reference to fellowship with God. But it picks up on something that he mentioned in verse 3. He says this, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now just think about this. The God who created everything by his words, by merely commanding that it exists and it begins to exist, The God who needs nothing from his creatures desires fellowship with us. Not out of loneliness, not out of some insecure need to be affirmed, not a slave-master relationship in which we find our identity and what we do for him, but fellowship in which we enjoy him. And amazingly enough, for some odd reason, he enjoys us. He draws us into this relationship of love and life and glory and joy that exists among Father and Son and Spirit. It's uh, very much like how the Westminster um, Confession begins, right? Or the Catechism. What's the chief duty of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And I hope that doesn't seem foreign to you. I hope (laughs) you are learning to enjoy the Lord. But this is breathtaking. Why? Would he desire fellowship with us? Yet he does. And if you're a follower of Christ, let me just encourage you. Think about that and and just let that create a sense of awe in you. As you wake up in the morning and it may seem, uh, I don't know, a bit of a chore to read the Bible or pray, and I know sometimes it is. Think about that. The Lord who created you, he loves you, desires fellowship with you. It's, it is truly staggering. Well, we'll move on to the second thing, and that is that to have this fellowship with God, we have to have a proper attitude toward him. That's in verses 5 to 7. So in verse 5, John sums up this message. He says, this is a message we've heard from him. This is what we declare. And he sums it up with this emphatic statement about what God is like. He says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So this is emphatic. It is a double negative. Mrs. Abadia, my eighth grade English teacher, taught me that a double negative is poor English. It negates the negation. So in southern U.S., you know, I might say, ain't no way. And she said, oh, really? Well, there is a way. Like, okay, thank you, Mrs. Abadia. I am here today. (laughs) But in other languages, like in Greek, it's not... It's, it's actually good Greek. It, it adds emphasis. True in Czech, too, right? It's got uh, a... Right? Okay, Czech speakers. I know, I just butchered it. But it, the same thing. 
Double negative, and it adds emphasis. Well, so what, is, what does this mean to say God is light? Well, light is used in various ways, but it's often used in Scripture of the illuminating and clarifying effects of the Word of God. For example, Psalm 119 and verse 105, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It guides, <laughs> guides me in day-to-day living. John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So you see in both of these things, you see things that we see in John, that is there is light, but also this idea of walking in light, being guided by light. So what, what does this mean? Well, we need to understand also that this truth, the word of God that, that guides us is not just facts. It's from a holy God. So it is moral truth. It is ethical truth. God reveals himself to us through truth so that we'll know him and like him. We will love what is good. We'll hate what's evil. Then John says we should walk in the light. So God is light, no darkness, emphatically, spotless purity, holiness, truth, guiding us. We should walk in this. And this means seeing ourselves and our world and our actions in light of who God has revealed himself to be in his word and living accordingly. So in the language of today's culture, we could say this is where we find our identity and our meaning and our purpose in life. Our natural tendency is to find identity and meaning and purpose in something other than God in our work or career and relationships, wealth, pleasure, whatever pursuit, relationship, whatever it may be. But none of these things, which may not be bad in themselves, None of these things can bring you into fellowship with God. None of them are are adequate. And if you uh, are in a relationship thinking that's going to be ultimate for you, you're putting an unbelievable amount of pressure on the other person. And you are asking from your work, you're asking from possessions, asking from whatever it is. You're asking something from that that only God can give you. So this statement, God is light, the command to walk in the light, it brings us to a crossroads. And we've got a choice to make. Are we going to walk in the light? Or are we going to walk, and they just walk in the light of who God is, or walk by our own light, by our own wisdom? It takes us back to the choice Adam and Eve made, faced in the garden, whether to trust what God had said, or to decide from themselves what is good and evil. And they chose the latter, unfortunately. Followed their heart, billions died. So, thank you. All right. John shows us this first by going back to the activity of the false teachers. Verse 6, they claim to be Christian. That is, they claim to have fellowship with God. But their new version of Jesus, as either not human, not fully divine, he can't save. And their new faith is not based on truth. It's based on a lie. So, no, they are, they are not true. They are false. And John states it plainly. If you claim to have fellowship with God, but walk in darkness, that is, you reject or deny his word, or you find meaning and purpose in life in something other than God, you are a liar. Any liars? Not, you don't have to raise your hand. But, but John makes it plain, right? There's, there's no middle ground here. You claim to have fellowship with God, but you reject his word, you're a liar. But then he moves quickly to show us two things that happen when we do walk in the light of God. First is that we have fellowship with each other. That's in verse 7. The light of, of God's word guides us in community with others who treasure Christ above everything else. So when we find our identity in Christ... Our, our identity, our understanding of who we are, how we see the world, it transcends everything else about us. So whether you're here today, no matter what country you are from, whether you're rich or poor, no matter the color of your skin, whatever else is going on in your life, we call each other brother and sister. And that is because of God's grace in the gospel. Because we treasure Christ more than we treasure anything else that might be true of us. And there might be a lot of things that are true of us, but they're not necessarily our identity, right? Now, the second thing that happens when we walk in the light is this, that this barrier to fellowship is removed. He says in verse 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And the rest of our text focuses on this, and that takes us to the third point, that to have fellowship with God, the barrier to fellowship has to be removed. So there is something that keeps us from fellowship with God. 
It is sin. Not a popular word today, but there it is. Sin does two things to us that prevent our fellowship with God. First, it captures our affections and enslaves us, and it blinds us. The second is that it offends God. So there's an effect on us. There's, there are consequences in terms of, of God because it offends him. And both of these things have to be addressed in order for us to have fellowship with God. So something must happen in us. That's in verses 8 to 10 of chapter 1, and that's a proper attitude towards sin. So C.S. Lewis said this. It's a familiar quote. You've heard it here before. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And walking in the light of God and his revealed truth makes us see everything more clearly light, light clarifies. And that means we see sin differently. We see sin for what it really is. And when this happens, we have a choice to make. John describes three responses when our sin is exposed. Two are mistakes, one is good. I hope you'll be able to pick out which is which. Um, First, he says in verse 8, we might say that we have no sin. This is a statement about ourselves, and it reflects a a deep uh, self-deception or a stunning lack of self-awareness. We justify ourselves, often at the expense of others, kind of like Adam did in the garden, right? He said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate, as if he had done nothing wrong, right? Justifying himself. No, sin, it's not mine, it's hers. Now, when I was a child and became ill, my mother would take me to the doctor. I was terrified of the doctor, terrified of getting a shot. The doctor would come in. To me, he seemed you know, two meters tall, you know, monstrous in size. He was, and I'm sure he was a super nice guy. Um, but he didn't seem so to tiny Preston. So he'd come in and ask, and he seemed to have this booming voice, what's the problem? And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm just going to shatter right here. What's wrong? And I would say before, I wouldn't even let my mother speak. I'd say, nothing. I'm fine. I don't know why she brought me here. My mom would say, well, you know, he's, he's been coughing a sore throat. I'm not coughing. My throat's fine. I'm fine. Don't know what her problem is. And my mom's 98, okay? There's a lot she doesn't remember. She remembers this. So we laugh about it. She as the nurse comes to see her, she goes to the doctor. I say, now, don't you do, you know, with the doctor what I used to do. And she'll laugh, say, okay, you know, I'll speak up. Fun. Well, it's funny, and yet it's not, because we have, this was going on with the Gnostics, what they were saying, another consequence of their false teaching. Remember, we said, what's material is bad, what's spiritual is good. And they drew such a dualism, a dichotomy there, that they basically would say, actually, what you do in the body doesn't affect your spiritual life because the two are completely separate. And so you could live a completely wicked life and still, quote, claim to be spiritual and in fellowship with God. So it just let them feel like they could have the best of everything, right? It's an incredible deception. But, you know, if I ask how many of you today are Gnostics, probably not going to get many hands raised, right? But we do have this issue because in our day, there are some who claim that they get to the place that they live a sinless life. Um, Remarkably, few of those are parents or married, but (laughs) still, (laughs) something about that just, you know, makes you, gives you a good mirror into what you really like. But... um, They claim they've reached this point. They're not just victorious over sin, but they're sinless. And uh, I've I've met a few over the years, not many, but some of them even here in Prague. Now, it's true that not sinning can be true at a behavioral level. That is, you're in conversation with someone and they make you really angry and you want to lose your temper and you don't. (laughs) You control what you say. Good job. Not sinning, okay? That's good. And I've had conversations with people where I fully expected to do that, and I have sat through the conversation like that, with my hand over my mouth, to keep from sinning, at least behaviorally, in, in conduct. And that's, that's good, all right? You know, I mean, Jesus says, take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. He's not saying rob fewer banks, you know? <laughs> this is not just about behavior. It is about the heart, okay? Because sin is not just what we do, it is in the heart. 
So sinless perfection in this life, like I've just described, it's, it is a teaching that is around. You'll encounter people like this. It is a grave, sober, serious misunderstanding of what Paul talks about when he talks about the law of sin that remains in the believer. Scripture tells us that when we come to faith in Christ, the power of sin is broken over us. This is what John talks about in this letter in chapter 3. And it's what Paul talks about in Romans 6 and 7 and 8. The power of sin is broken, but we are not perfect. We are new creatures, but not perfect. And sin remains, just not in control, but it's there, sort of like the law of gravity. It just, it just affects everything that we do. So there's no part of us that's not touched by sin. At the same time, there's no part of us that's not touched by grace. Okay, So sin doesn't have the last word in us. The gospel does. Christ does. But sin is there. Okay. Now, second wrong response to the light is in verse 10. So we can't say, I'm sinless. We can't say, I have no sin. And verse 10 is another wrong response. That is to deny that we have sinned. Basically, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. The first statement is about who we are. It's about our character. The second statement is about our actions. It is... It is redefining things right and wrong to make what we're doing sound okay. It's rationalizing our behavior. So we say, you know, I'm not being greedy. I'm just working long, long hours to have a secure, happy future. And my family doesn't even appreciate it. Uh, yeah, that's it's just redefining the motivating factor. We say, you know, this, this isn't lust. Definitely not adultery. It's just this uh, TikTok video that, that popped up on my phone that I watch for three hours. There's, there's something wrong here. We, we rationalize. We say, no, that's okay. It's just, you know, take time. How, how long are they? Don't, don't act like you don't know. No. I think they're just a few seconds, right? Something like that. Okay, good. Thanks. Very helpful. Um, you get the idea. I know we say, I'm not being manipulative. I'm just, I'm just prone to worry, and, and I, just, I just need to be in control. You can supply your own example, okay? You get the idea. We redefine sin to make ourselves just a little above the grade. But that's not walking in the light. The proper response is in verse 9, to confess or acknowledge our sin. This means to acknowledge our sin before God for what it is, to sin, to accept God's judgment, both of our character, uh, against verse 8, and against our actions, what we've done, it's verse 10, and when we do this, it's like we're taking, we're almost a little bit schizophrenic. We take sides with God against ourselves. We say, God, you are right. I am wrong. This action, it is mine. I regret it. Have mercy. Forgive me for Christ's sake. And when, so we acknowledge God is right. This is exactly what we see happen with David. When he was confronted quickly acknowledged his sin. There was no more protest. There was no more cover-up. You know, there were other times you read in the Old Testament where prophets confronted kings and the king has the prophet removed or even killed. But David didn't do that. That's, you know, I think a part of why we understand he really was a man after God's heart. Was deeply flawed, but a man after God's heart. When he was confronted, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And a heart made tender, tender, by grasping the holiness of God and the grace of God in the gospel, is quick to confess and quick to acknowledge sin. So, um, what, what's your response when maybe you're walking the light, you, you, you maybe feel guilty about something, you say, what's your first response? Is it to rationalize, say, no, that's not sin? Or is it to say, I've sinned against the Lord? You're going to find more hope if you'll just be honest and acknowledge these things as sin. Because something beautiful happens when we do confess our sins to the Lord. He forgives us. We understand that all our sins were forgiven when Christ died and rose again. But just as when you hurt somebody that you love and there's tension in the relationship and it's got to be resolved, this is something very similar in our relationship with the Lord. We confess our sin and for that forgiveness becomes a reality in our experience. Because we're not meant to dwell on the sin we move immediately from there to grace, to Christ, paying the price, dying and rising again. But it's not just forgiveness and not just a legal transaction here. He also purifies us. He cleanses us because sin makes us unfit to be in God's presence. It makes us unfit for fellowship with him. 
And I would dare say, if you find yourself avoiding the Lord, that's probably a sign that you are not walking in the light. Because you know there's something that he will want to address in your own life. But he purifies us. He cleanses us. He restores us to fellowship with him. He, he takes those things off the, the, weight, the weight of those things off our conscience. Now, some of you today, you hear this, and you actually may feel overwhelmed by sin, your own sin. Well, hear me. Uh, first, take heart. Um, the closer you get to the light, the clearer your own inward corruptions become. Okay. That is, you feel very discouraged by sin that you see in your life. That actually might be a good sign. <laughs> You're closer to the light. You see things more clearly. And it's the tender heart that responds to that to say, Lord, you see it. You know it's there. Have mercy. Forgive me for Christ's sake. Also take heart because you are in the right battle. Now if you find sin in your heart and it makes you happy, that's a problem. Okay, But if you recognize there is sin and corruption in your own heart and it grieves you, that's a good sign. You're in the right battle and you have the right enemy. Sin's your enemy. God is an enemy you don't want. Okay? He is the sworn enemy of sin. So you need to get on God's side against sin, against your own sin. But also know that, that the enemy of our souls also seems to delight in accusing us and bringing up past failures. There's the, the, the well, what my generation would call a bumper sticker. Now we call memes. But, uh, <laughs> you know, when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Um, but the enemy does accuse us. He brings up things. Sometimes they're things we've, we've done. Sometimes it's general overwhelming. You are just a worthless pile of garbage. You need to learn to recognize that voice. Because that's not the voice of God. Because when the Spirit of God convicts you of sin, he does it, he does it specifically. He'll put his finger on it say, and it's like this. And you say, oh yeah. And he does it legitimately. I know it's true. And he does it redemptively to lead you to freedom. When the enemy accuses us, it is to overwhelm us and cause us to be full of despair and look away from Christ and just become utterly self-focused. So if you're overwhelmed by sin, take heart. You're in the right battle. You've got the right enemy. But preach the gospel to yourself. Verse 9 says, he is faithful and righteous to forgive and to cleanse. He's faithful because it's what he's promised to do, and he keeps his promises. All his promises to us are yes in Christ, yes and amen. He is faithful. When you sin again, he is faithful. Anybody here have any new sins? Again, you don't have to raise your hand. I'll, I'll do that for you. I don't think I have any new sins. <laughs> They're just same old sins for my 62 years. <laughs> Uh, but still he is faithful to forgive and cleanse. Lord, it is me. Yes, I have done this again. And he is faithful to forgive and to cleanse. And he is righteous. He is just. Because Christ has died for our sins, he has paid the penalty for our sins, and he's risen again. When we confess our sins to God and ask him to forgive us because of what Christ did, he would be unjust not to forgive. You preach the gospel to yourselves. But this leads directly to what John talks about in, in the next, in the first two verses of chapter 2. He says in verse 1 that he's, he said, I've written these things to you so that you may not sin. Okay, so that is so that we'll avoid sinful choices and actions. So what John wrote is scripture, right? He's an apostle, eyewitness of Christ. We have this letter from him and his gospel and the revelation, other letters. What he wrote scripture, I don't think it's a mistake for us to take a moment and just understand how scripture helps us avoid sin. First, it points us to Christ as the all-satisfying light of life. It points us to Christ. That's the only place we're going to learn about Christ is in his word, and that's where we need to be. It helps us by having our hearts satisfied in Christ. 
It helps us avoid sin. It shows, another thing the Word does, it shows us how terrible sin really is. It shows us its consequences. We saw it a bit in David's life last week. And we see it in, in many other passages. It shows us how terrible, how horrible, how catastrophic, how perverted sin really is. And Scripture gives us promises from God that nourish our faith, hope, and love. And Scripture warns us against the consequences of sin. You see all those. You can think of passages. But notice God's mercy. John says, I write these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, that is, in spite of having his word, in spite of having fellowship with him, we still sin. Even when we are walking in the light, we still sin. And when we do sin, there is forgiveness and there is cleansing and there is hope because we have an advocate with the Father. The word translated advocate there in verse 2, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's the same word Jesus used of the Holy Spirit in John 14. It's translated there, helper or comforter in some translations. It's uh, translated intercessor in other places. It's sort of describes someone in sort of like a defense attorney role in a courtroom. And let's think about that for a minute. What a wonderful advocate we have in Christ. Because like a good attorney, he knows the law. In fact, he fulfilled it. He is called here Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he knows our case because he knows us intimately. He knows us better than we know ourselves. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all points, just as we are. So let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, where we receive mercy, find grace to help in time of need. And he also knows the judge. I mean, wouldn't you want that in an attorney, right? He knows the law, he knows your case, and he knows the judge. In fact, he's the judge's favorite son. He can do no wrong. In fact, the judge only needs to see you with your attorney. And the case is dismissed. Because this attorney has done something no other attorney would ever do. Now, I have three attorneys in my immediate family. I can promise you none of them (laughs) would do this even for me. He has paid the price. He has served the sentence for the crimes of which we are committed. And he need only stand and show his wounds. The price has been paid. No attorney would do this, but we have in Christ far greater than an attorney, far greater than any intercessor. We have someone who has reconciled us to God, someone who restores us to God, someone who's defeated death for us, who brings us to God. John says Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That describes the the purpose, the significance of his death. Atoning sacrifice is how the NIV translates a word it's translated propitiation in, in other translations, and I really appreciate the NIV's attempt at, at clarity, but friends, you need propitiation. <laughs> this is a word you need to know, okay? It's a really good word. So that's okay, no, not, not uh, throwing sh- shade at the NIV, but propitiation, it's a great word. Now, in the pagan religions, there were various gods. Each had some ability to make your life harder, make your life easier, depending on just really the mood of the day. They could be fickle, capricious, but a person's only hope in their worldview was to offer some impressive and costly sacrifice to somehow win that god's favor and get their desired results. So we have in ancient history Agamemnon, a Greek, the commander of Greek armies, wanting to engage Troy in battle. And he needs favorable winds to sail there with his army. He can't get the winds he needs. He offers his daughter as a sacrifice to the goddess Artemis so that he can get the winds he needs and go engage in the Trojan Wars. Well, some balk at the term propitiation because of stories like this, because they say it just seems pagan, cosmic child abuse. But we need to realize three things. First, Sin arouses God's just wrath. This is not a fickle mood. This is not God losing temper. It is not a capriciousness on his side. It is his, on his side. It is his settled judicial opposition to sin. He hates sin. Okay. So sin arouses, evokes his wrath. The second thing we need to understand is that this is not a sacrifice that we offer hoping to win his favor. It is a sacrifice 
He has already provided. He bears his own wrath for us. He provides the sacrifice, not us. And the third thing is this. This happens not because someone wins God's favor for us, but because he is already favorable toward us. Jesus doesn't win the Father's favor for us. We already have it. So the biblical understanding of propitiation really has very little in common with the pagan understanding. It just reminds us of the infinite price that was paid freely and gladly by the Father to bring us into fellowship with him. It really is breathtaking. Now, another thing the Gnostics taught was that salvation came through secret knowledge that was available only to the truly spiritual, enlightened people. But John says an emphatic no to this. He says Christ's death is sufficient for the salvation of any person, not just apostles like John, not just Jews like John, but the whole world. And this, what happened with Christ was not secret. It was public display. He's crucified, open for all to see. So there's nothing secret. There's no secret knowledge here. This is an open display of God's actions in history. Sometimes the death of Christ is described in terms of its intent related to election. So there's Ephesians 5, Christ gave his life for the church. John 10, he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. But here, John describes this in terms of its inherent sufficiency because of who Christ is. So as we close, first, enjoy fellowship with God. Don't ever lose a sense of awe over being called into fellowship with the Father, Son, and Spirit and this, this life, this existence of glory and joy and life and love. And fellowship not only with Father, Son, and Spirit, with, with all those who are His. Uh, you know, sometimes people ask about ICP, ask me about it. And the way I describe ICP the most often is we are a really big bag of mixed nuts. <laughs> but you know, we belong, we're, we're Jesus. We, we belong to him. So that's okay. We can be a little nutty. We're his. And for his sake, we love one another, call each other brother and sister. So enjoy fellowship with the Lord. Walk in the light. That is, immerse yourself in the word of God. Read it. Meditate on it. Internalize it. Live it. Third, when you see sin... When God exposes sin to your heart, confess it. Be like David, quick to confess. Not quick to cover up, not quick to rationalize, not deny, but confess and acknowledge your sin. And then fourth, just reflect on the price paid to bring you into fellowship with him. This is what the Bible calls propitiation, a sacrifice that turns away the just wrath of God. As Paul says at the end of 1 Thessalonians, Jesus We wait for Jesus who who comes, who will save us from the wrath to come. And then finally, the message John proclaimed to this church, first century, is a message we're proclaiming to you today, that God is light, in him there's no darkness at all. He calls you to come, to walk in the light, to come enjoy fellowship with him, to put your hope in Christ alone, who has died and risen again, to bring you into fellowship with God. So we pray God will speak to your heart draw you to himself. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for desiring fellowship with us. We recognize we are unworthy. But we thank you and we love you and we find our greatest joy in your presence. And I pray you'll give us tender hearts that will be quick to acknowledge sin, quick to embrace you in your holiness and goodness and truth and faithfulness. And I pray that the gospel will bear great fruit, deep fruit in our lives, heart change, that you'll renew every good affection that you have placed in our hearts and renew every, every good work of grace that you have begun, that we might love you more deeply, more purely, more genuinely, that we might hate sin more fervently, might see it clearly for what it is. We confess our weakness. We confess As the old hymn says, we are prone to wander, Lord. I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Father, I pray you'll renew your grace in each of our lives. For those who do not yet know you, I pray they will see Christ as desirable. They will hunger for you. They will come to you, put their hope in you, and find in you everything for which their heart hungers. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.